Well, hello, everybody. Dudley Brown here at the Rocky Mountain Gun Owners Headquarters in Loveland, Colorado. I'll be joined by our attorney here in just a few moments, but uh, we are here today to tell you about our constitutional challenge to the Colorado magazine ban. So while we're waiting for everybody to join, what I'd like you to do is hit like there on the bottom of your screen. We want you to host a watch party. That's pretty easy. Just click share. And there's a little button there that allows you to host a watch party to get other people involved, all your friends on Facebook. Um, so it's a way to share. And then uh, the next step is give us a comment. Tell us where you're watching from. If you're watching from outside of Colorado, let us know. Uh, if you're watching from Colorado, tell us what city you're from and, and get a comment. If you're an Arms Go member, we always like to know that. An actual dues paid member, you know, say I'm a member or tell us how long you've been a member. We like to know that. Um, you're the people who make this happen and everybody else is just a free rider, aren't they? No, we're happy to have anybody uh, involved in this at any level. So um, uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to be joined by our attorney, Barry Arrington, and we're going to talk about the uh, November 14th challenge we have in front of the Colorado Supreme Court. It's the end of a very long journey that started in 2013. And so let's bring Barry on um, from his law offices in Denver, uh, in the People's Republic of Denver, is uh, uh, our attorney, Barry Arrington. He's a former Colorado legislator. He was one of the most conservative legislators in Colorado history. Uh, and, and Barry's one of the, a, a well-known constitutional attorney in Colorado um, who has done a lot of work for RMGO in the years, but this has been the Mac Daddy of them all, Barry. You've been the lead attorney in fighting against this magazine ban. So welcome. Well, thank you for having me, Dudley. And you're right. It's been a long, arduous journey, six years in the making to get to the Colorado Supreme Court. And from the very beginning, we were teeing this challenge up to arrive in the Colorado Supreme Court. And we're finally here. We're finally here. And we went through um, a kind of a torturous uh, path to get here. It wasn't like it just went to court and then we ended up appealing it all the way up. It's gone up and down and around. And, and frankly, it's been a learning experience for me. I've been involved in a lot of court cases, but I'm not an attorney and I don't pretend to be one. And so, I mean, really Barry here has kind of educated me to uh, uh, where we've been, how we, how the fight happens and the way it progresses. Yes, so it's been a long tri a trip and back and forth. So we filed our complaint the, the month after the mag ban was effective so that, uh, in August of 2013. And the Denver District Court uh, dismissed the complaint, said you don't even have a claim. And we appealed that to the Colorado Court of Appeals, and the Colorado Court of Appeals uh, reversed that decision, saying, yeah, if they can prove what they say in that complaint, they've got a claim. And we went back down, and we had a week-long trial in May of 2017, and the Denver District Court said, well, yeah, you did kind of prove what you said in the complaint, but I'm still going to say you didn't have sufficient evidence to prove that it's unconstitutional. And he made, in, in our view, a very tortuous interpretation of the statute to arrive there. Went up to the Colorado Court of Appeals again, and this time it was a different panel from the one that said that held the first time, and they upheld the uh, trial court and dismissing our claims this time after the trial. And then we um, went to, apologize for the phone, uh, we went to the uh, Colorado Supreme Court and asked for uh, them to uh, grant certiorari, our petition for certiorari, which means it's a discretionary review, and they did grant our petition, and uh, we briefed it, and now the argument is due and in, 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 uh, going to be held in November. Now, I'd like to ask a couple questions for the benefit of the people watching, but first, um, you know, we need some clarification. We've got a lot of lawsuits that have, have been happening um, regarding this particular uh, uh, case, I mean, I mean, the magazine ban itself, the law, there was another lawsuit that people sometimes confuse with ours. And they That's sometimes right. call it the sheriff's lawsuit, if you want to talk about That's that. Right. The sheriff's lawsuit occurred basically the same time. And here's the big difference between the sheriff's lawsuit and our lawsuit. The sheriff's lawsuit was a federal case in the federal district court, and it asserted federal constitutional claims under the Second Amendment. 
Our case is a state lawsuit in the state courts, and it asserts claims only under the Colorado Constitution. I'll talk about in a minute why we went there. The federal case was dismissed on standing grounds. The Tenth Circuit Court of Appeals held that the plaintiffs in that case didn't have the right to bring it. And so it was kind of a non-entity. When it's vacated, it basically said they didn't have jurisdiction to decide. Our case was not dismissed on standing grounds. We are considering it on the merits. Why did we bring a uh, state case and specifically not bring Second Amendment claims, but Article 2, Section 13? What's Article 2, Section 13? That's the Colorado state constitutional analog to the Second Amendment. Our co state constitution protects the right to keep and bear arms to a greater extent, we're arguing, than even in the Second Amendment. And that's why we are testing that. We have uh, decided we're going to bring it up and say, yes, it, it's greater. How much greater? Well, and and let's, uh, I can think I can recite most of that, Article 2, Section 13. It's on the back of our Rocky Mountain Gun Owners First, an original T-shirt, our Liberty, Liberty or Death, and and um, and Liberty's T-shirts is, it is Article 2, Section 13 says the right of no person to keep and bear arms in defense of home property, yada, 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 shall be called in question. And I always ask people that, you know, they, they get the infringed and, and there's a debate with well-regulated militia. And of course, we take a position on that with the federal constitution. We think it's very absolute. But the state constitution says, says shall... Um, no person's right to keep bare arms shall shall be called in question. How much more explicit can we get? I mean, not even cringe. Can't even talk about it. Can't even call it into question. It's she, cannot it's call it into question. Well, yeah. what is a Brady check? What is um, what is taking a firearm but calling in question their right to keep and bear arms? It, well, one 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 of the points that we're trying to make in this case is that the the not only the text, but the history of constitutional analysis in the Colorado Supreme Court is that in certain areas, uh, the state provision extends much broader protections to the right than the federal provision. Uh, provision. For example, the Colorado Court of, uh, Supreme Court has held that the Article 2, Section 10, the First Amendment analog, and it protects the right to free expression much greater than this First Amendment even. Uh, the Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable searches and seizures, much broader protections under the state constitution. Due process, broader protection. And, and, the, and the test, the Supreme Court says, is what is the text? What's the history and tradition of the state of, of Colorado? We're saying, look at the text, look at the history and, the, and tradition. And here's the interesting part. The state's own uh, expert witness, the attorney general called Saul Carnell to do a historical analysis of the right to keep and bear arms in the founding period, 1876 to 1900. And he admitted on the stand there was not a single, not even one regulation anywhere, state uh, or local, that uh, prohibited any firearm whatsoever. Uh, and then- So in other words, historically, in other words, historically, they knew they couldn't touch it. Absolutely. And, and so they, they passed uh, what was, at the time, the broadest protection of the right to keep and bear arms of any state that had it in its constitution. They consciously took the broadest provision prior to that, which was the Missouri provision, and expanded it. And now, Barry, this is before um, you, uh, you didn't do this part of the legal work, but the, Mac the McDonald case, which is some people call the Chicago case which was incorporating the Second Amendment to the states, um, in which Mr. McDonald, a, a Chicago resident, had, um, had his rights denied by, by Illinois and Chicago uh, uh, under the Second Amendment. And he challenged it and went to the U.S. Supreme Court. And in the opinion of Justice Alito, in the majority opinion, he actually quoted us, at Rocky Mountain Gun Owners brief, uh, filing uh, amicus brief on that, that saying... Uh, where we had filed all of the Western states' constitutions and, and their provisions for for protecting the Second Amendment, making the case that no, in the West here, it's very absolute, and it, it's so it has to be incorporated to the states. 
And Justice Alito at that time wrote absolutely, and he he cited Rocky Mountain gun owners in the majority opinion. And so it call when we did that research on all these western states, Colorado was at the top of the heap. There was nobody who had a stronger constitutional protection for the right to keep arms than Colorado. Nobody. And, here, and here's one of the points that we make in our brief. Colorado Constitution was effective on August 1, 1876. From August 1, 1876 until 1972, nearly a century, the Colorado General Assembly did not pass any regulations concerning the right to keep and bear arms. Right. Nearly a century. Uh, from a state law perspective, it was still legal to, ha uh, to ha hold an unlicensed machine gun in Colorado until 18 1972. Now, obviously, that would have been uh, an issue under the 1934 Federal Act. But the point is, our state constitution, our state's tradition and history is very, very libertarian when it comes to, well, several things. The right to free expression, the court has already held that. The right to, uh, to be free of unreasonable search and seizures, the court has already held that. And we're saying, if it's if it's that's the test for free expression and searches and seizures, why not the same test for the right to keep and bear arms? If you just joined us, I'm I'm talking with Barry Arrington, our attorney, who's explaining our magazine ban case and our constitutional challenge for that magazine ban case. And and I want to get kind of bring it back. Um, there was a Johnny in Cripple Creek said pretty friggin clear. I mean, it's crystal clear, uh, both on a federal but especially on a state. And that's why we, uh, from Rocky Mountain Gunner's perspective, went and challenged it on a state level, is we thought the state constitution is so clear and we knew we had standing. Now we're still, again, this was filed in the summer of 2013. Six years later, more than six years, we're now at the end of our journey. And so many people have asked, hey, can we repeal this to the US Supreme Court? And I'd rather let the attorney answer that but I know the answer. So the answer is, well, before I give you that answer, let me just say this about Rocky Mountain gun owners. Uh, it hasn't been free. And the people who are watching this, the, 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 the dues and contributions that they've paid to RMGO have paid over $100,000 in fees and expenses and that sort of thing in these six years. And so uh, this challenge would have never been made. A, a, per, a, a individual, uh, unless he's extremely wealthy, would not have had the wherewithal to bring this challenge. No. RMGO stepped up and paid the bills. And I, I appreciate that uh, well, for obvious reasons. I appreciate your members as well. Well, and you're giving us a great deal on this because you care about the issue and you've been a RMGO member since we founded it. But um, actually the number, I hate to say this, the number is, is well beyond that. Uh, I think we're above 200 and, and still counting because, uh, but the trial was very expensive. As you knew, we did a week long trial and, uh, and I was there mostly a lot to learn, um, but also to, to talk with you and, and get better grasp of how we're fighting this. I was flabbergasted in that week long trial by, by the judge, the, the district court judge who, who was a uh, Ritter appointee and who essentially admitted he already decided how he was going to rule. Well, we kind of knew where his proclivities were from the uh, uh, very beginning when he dismissed the case without even giving us a trial. Uh, but l let me answer the question about whether uh, you can appeal this to the United States Supreme Court. The United States Supreme Court has said when a state Supreme Court has ruled definitively on the state constitutional issue, that's the final court and the United States Supreme Court will not uh, challenge that. That's, a, that's actually a good thing from a Tenth Amendment perspective. And so this is the end of the road for this case. Colorado Supreme Court has the final say. And yep. in, in the, the, the trial, we, we did two things. We, we said, one, this magazine ban applies to all magazines. And even the attorney general says if it do, really does apply to all magazines, it's unconstitutional. And we, did, we said, how does it apply to all magazines? Well, we said, well, it's, it says not only if it's 15 uh, rounds, but 15 rounds or expandable to more than 15 rounds easily. And we demonstrated at trial, we had our gun expert, Mark Passamedic, yeah. sit at the stand and take four different magazines, convert all four of them to hold more than 15 rounds in less than 30 seconds. And Mark's a, an engineer 
um, who's been involved both in the shooting community and as well as uh, firearms and accessory design. And so he really was a good expert to stand up there and show what most people watching this who own an AR-15 or or you know, even a Glock, you know, see you can see how to take that magazine apart, take the spring out, reassemble it, disassemble it, and if if you wanted to, snap on an extension, bada bing, bada boom, you now have an illegal magazine. Well, that makes that a convertible magazine. Therefore, that's illegal. Now, what was weird is, is the the then Attorney General uh, Cynthia Kaufman and her team actually did some pretty stupid things. Um, and though, though she claimed to be opposed to the magazine ban, um, she, her legal team did a lot of things that were um, weren't helpful in this case. Well, and, I mean, they defended the law, and and one and and so John Southers actually, when the when the case came out, issued what he called technical guidance, saying, yeah, they're, they're readily convertible, but if they have other functions, that, that, that the statute doesn't apply. The, the Southern's construction of the statute does not, is not supported by the statute's plain text. It's not supported by the statute's obvious intent. It was a clear post hoc, this statute's crazily unconstitutional. We're just gonna try to fix it uh, with, with, by waving our hands. Uh, and and the, basically the trial court bought that. Barry, did you just revert to Latin on us? Is that what happened? I mean, you, by waving our hands, right? You, yeah, you guys know that when that when an attorney starts using Latin, you know, a lot of our eyes glaze over. Um, uh, but I've gotten used to it. So, so yeah, John Southers really um, didn't wasn't helpful, and frankly, was relatively obtuse to the political realities as well as the legal realities. Um, it's why if John Southers ever ran for anything else, we would um, Rocky Mountain Gunners would be there to have comment. The reason uh, that the, the magazine is alive, ban is alive today can be pinned on John Southers. If he hadn't issued that technical guidance, it would be gone by now. You think so? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, well, um, and there are a lot of things that, that made this uh, where it is today. Um, if if uh, Dave Copel had not given the Democrats their um, technical amendment at the last minute in the state Senate uh, to basically write out pump shotguns, in the description, um, we, we probably would have had it overturned too. So um, I, I look back and say, if people hadn't made stupid mistakes and actually cared um, not about their own ego, but about defeating it, they would have defeated it. Um, so that, let's move on uh, to, to our second challenge. So we're saying on its face, this applies to all magazines and even the state agrees that if it applies to all magazines, uh, it's unconstitutional. They, they did just make a weird argument that it doesn't. Uh, then we say that even if it isn't applying to all magazines, only uh, uh, a, some sub subset of those, it's still unconstitutional under the state constitution because regulate one, our constitution, as we've already discussed, protects the right to keep and bear arms to an extraordinary extent. Yeah. And, and the history and traditions of the state of, of Colorado, no regulations at all until 1972 at the state level. And, and so we're saying this goes directly to our right to, to defense of our own home. And I, the, the, one of the points that I've made in my brief is the state called witnesses saying, you don't need these uh, for self-defense. And, and I'm saying is if I'm defending against someone who has a, a magazine with a capacity greater than 15, I want to be at least as well armed as the criminal that's attacking me. Of course, well, it applies to self-defense. Well, Congressman Thomas Massey, the House uh, Second Amendment Caucus chairman, made this point. If if three police officers, it was a three or five police officers in Dayton who responded to the, the shooter there, um, used 62 rounds and had uh, multiple 30 round magazines or large, quotes, large capacity magazines. Um, why do you think to deal with that one guy, and these are so-called experts, why why should you tell the single mother she needs less tools to defend her kids? That's outrageous. Absolutely. That's, That's outrageous. That you bet. And, and, huh? and so uh, they're saying that it doesn't um, diminish your effectiveness as self-defense it one bit, but that doesn't make any even logical sense. Of course it diminishes our effectiveness. The whole point of the law is to deny the increased effectiveness to criminals. 
And if it, if it increases their effectiveness, it increases ours as well. Right. Um, I remember the when we actually had testimony on this bill in 2013, when we were in the House Judiciary Committee, uh, we actually had a, brought in a, uh, a former pawn shop owner from Arizona who was assaulted by three um, men and had to use two 15-round magazines in his handgun to defend, to fight them off uh, as they were trying to rob and therefore and kill him. And he actually had to change magazines because it was a shootout with things in the way. And um, and he said, if it weren't for um, having a, a, a decent sized capacity magazine, I wouldn't be alive today. Um, and he makes a good point. And there are many people who make that point. I, we see those stories come through all the time where where somebody used a 30 round magazine and an AR-15 to fend off uh, somebody in their home or, or their business. Um, so the, the next thing that we, we, we talked about in our case, it was this, that that uh, the state says, well, even if it does have some sort of effect on your on your uh, right to defense, it is justified by the uh, benefits of the law. And we said, what benefits? We, what so benefits? We, we, we hired uh, Carl Moody, a, a, a Ph.D. statistician out of William and Mary to come in. And, and Dr. Moody testified there's absolutely zero statistical effect on bans of um, high capacity magazines in other states between that and the general gun crime rate. And there's uh, no demonstrated effect even on mass shootings. As a matter of fact, the state's own expert testified that two thirds of the mass shootings that he was talking about, high capacity magazines weren't even involved. And so uh, we're, we're saying that that the, the, uh, the odds of getting uh, killed in a mass shooting are about, um, one in 30 million. And so you're saying that a one in 30 million chance justifies making illegal prospectively literally millions of magazines. The state uh, stipulated in the case, there are millions of these, not in the country, just the state of Colorado. And, and so yes. under Heller's common use test, if millions doesn't get there in a state of 5 million, there, nothing does. Now, I'll confess, uh, personally, I've done my very best to increase those averages of the number of magazines owned by one gun owner um, and did that many, many years ago. Because, of course, once you once a magazine fails, if you have one magazine for a semi-automatic firearm, magazine fed firearm, you have one and, and it fails. The gun's worthless. If that's the only way you can feed that weapon and um, the gun's worthless. And, and so I tell any AR-15 owner, if you don't have 10 per rifle, um, you're crazy. Because they do fail. They were originally designed to fail. Um, now, uh, to get back to the, the Carl Moody, I, the thing I, in the trial that really kind of was interesting to me was uh, uh, Carl went through um, some statistics about this clearinghouse in Virginia. I don't know if you want to talk about that and, and what they found about the magazine, the 10-year Feinstein uh, bad. As a matter of fact, there was an inverse relationship between that ban and, and gun safety. Uh, it, so it, it, certainly uh, the statistics don't support uh, that there's a, a, a relationship between uh, gun, gun homicides and these magazine bans. And so the other thing that is very important is he talked about uh, relative risks. He is, you know, we hear about these shootings all the time, and they're tragic events. We're not diminishing that at all. Of course. But keep, let's keep it in perspective. Dr. Moody testified you're five times likely, more likely to be, die from a bee sting than from a mass shooting. You're, you're many, many, many times more likely to die in an automobile accident. You're more likely to die in your, uh, of drowning in your bathtub. These are some of the things that you're trying to put this in perspective. Why are we trying to put it in perspective? Well, you've got a ban on millions of firearm components here and a, and, a, and a very, very, in my view, non-existent benefit to justify that ban. Those two don't fit under any constitutional analysis. Matter of fact, the trial court was forced to hold that is a fact. The trial court held as a fact there is no relationship between magazine bans and general gun crime. And, and the was forced to rely exclusively on these tenuous uh, hypothetical 
maybe sorts of banned uh, uh, benefits in, in the mass shooting context. Well, and then Carl, the interesting part is Carl then, Carl Moody went as our, uh, did our research and, and we paid him to, to do research. And then he went and applied that same research to the California case on the magazine ban in which the California court ruled against the magazine ban. And, That's exactly and right. I like to say that, that we gave Carl an education in how to testify in, in uh, magazine ban cases because the, the, the case that we uh, brought him in was the very first time he has testified as an expert witness. And he did such a fine job, they hired him in California. And as you just said, the, the district court in that case issued a, a uh, injunction, struck the California magazine ban down. And um, now talk... That's supplemental authority to our case in the in, as we come before the Colorado Supreme Court because that wasn't available, that hadn't happened yet when we did our trial. That's right, and we we cite that California case extensively in our briefs. It's a very very good, well well reasoned uh, opinion by that uh, California court. Well, after six more than six years, and a lot of time and money and effort and you know staff brain power and and work um we are now kind of almost at the end of our journey and on november 14th we're going to go before the colorado supreme court and they'll be the final authority i you know i am kind of a betting man but i'm not somebody who likes to bet on stuff like i mean we did kind of bet on stuff like this right um because we felt like members really had to be represented and had to make our best effort. Uh, sometimes you fail at that. So there are many things you don't control. I think we made our best effort. It, maybe we made a couple of mistakes. I can't look back and say on a legal challenge, we really made anything I would try and do again. I, I, I'm very satisfied with the job that we did in, in, the, in the trial court and the court of appeals. And it, it, at the end of the day, there is enough there for the Colorado Supreme Court. There's way more than enough there for the Colorado Supreme Court to make the ruling that we're asking it to make. And it's simply this. Uh, you've said in the First Amendment and the Fourth Amendment areas, if the text of the Colorado Constitution is broader than the federal Constitution, if the history and traditions of the people of Colorado support a broader right, the state Constitution supports a broader right in those areas. We're saying, well, it's clearly broader, the text of the constitutional provision in the uh, right to keep and bear arms, Article 2, Section 13. Nobody disputes that. The history and traditions of the state of Colorado, a hundred years before the General Assembly enacted its first regulation of any sort of firearms. No, the state's own expert witness said there was zero regulation of firearms at any level state or local, in the founding period. And so we're saying to the Colorado Supreme, Supreme Court, if that's the best, we clearly made it. <laughs> well, Barry, um, so I want to make sure that people understand we're not talking about our red flag lawsuit, which is a, a challenge uh, against the uh, Colorado General Assembly that the law was passed unconstitutionally because they refused to read the red flag bill at length. That's a different, separate legal issue. And we're fighting that too. Um, we're gonna try and give you an update on that very soon, though we're still waiting from, uh, for a judge to rule on that. Um, and uh, we're not talking about the sheriff's lawsuit, which uh, was dismissed uh, several years ago. Uh, we're really talking about RMGO's uh, sole challenge to this, uh, the mag this ridiculous magazine ban in the state of Colorado based on Colorado law. And, and we're going to find out. I don't know when we get a decision, Barry. Can you tell me? So the uh, argument is in November. And I, I expect a decision by spring. Decision by spring. That's my expectation, that, although there's no real uh, deadline. But I expect a decision by spring. Well, and to, to put a pin in it um, with everyone, understand that we're trying to fight uh, this magazine ban and, and to overturn it uh, in the legislative level. We're trying in the courts, we're trying at the elect, at the election box, uh, the ballot box to, uh, um, to elect people who will overturn this and, and repeal it. Um, we're trying in every level we can because we think this is a, a hill to die on, so to speak. 
And as a matter of fact, we have two challenges to the to the magazine ban. One is we, we, we're saying the entire statute's unconstitutional, as, as I've explained before. We're saying also that if you're even inclined to uh, say that part of it's constitutional, you need to sever the obviously uh, unconstitutional language that makes every magazine out there illegal. And so we, we could get a partial victory in this as well. Yeah. Well, I hope we do. And uh, um, I want to thank both you, Barry, and then especially those people who are members of RMGO who have been donors. We had a we had a couple of large donors, including one very large donor from Aspen, who uh, uh, played a big role in in making this court case happen. And, um, and all along, he came on board and said, "I'll match donations and and uh, I'll write big checks because I want this to happen. I don't want to, my state to uh, to um, have its constitutional protections destroyed." Uh, but give yourself a pat on the back if you're a member. And I, I asked you, you know, people who are watching who are not members, um, if not, if you're not a member, why not? Um, we need you. Um, this isn't the only fight we're happening. We're kind of at the end of the road on this one, uh, even though we still haven't fully funded it. Uh, um, we've got other challenges and other fights. So thank you, Barry. And uh, thank you, members. And uh, God bless.